The police started quite a fair bit of the trouble, I'd say. Going in too heavy. Even on days when nothing happened, the old bill would be there pushing. And I'm not talking about just us, I'm talking about ordinary pedestrians on the street, like, you know? Pushing them all along the seafront to try and get them over onto the beach. Everyone was piling over the wall because the police was trying to push everyone away like from the sea from the seafront to get them on here out of the way. So uh, that's when we all jumped over the walls and whatever. They had not like all the Bristol lot was behind the police and they segregated both lots. So uh, that's how come we ended up on here. That fateful day. It's all quiet on the western seafront these days. It wasn't always like this. Twenty years ago, a gang of teenagers from a local housing estate terrorised the beaches. No bank holiday passed without a battle. They were called the Squad. I knew them in their heyday, all fanatical about Bristol Rovers. All mad, bad and dangerous to know. The stories are well documented by the press, police and the courts. But what about their own stories? Budgie, Daffy, Mountain, Sweat, Wally, oh and Tome. The characters are as vivid now as they were 20 years ago. The squad members all came from the notorious Bourneville estate. Isolated from the town of Weston by the two main railway lines to the west. An estate full of bored young men. As luck would have it, I got the chance to come back 20 years later to listen to their stories and look back on those infamous days. come from a tough club in Birmingham expecting Western Supermare to be somewhere quite quiet. I was quickly enlightened that it wasn't and um, it was just as bad as where I'd come from in the inner city. Well, it all started back in 74, 75, back at school. It was um, Wally Vowles, Pagey. He's, he's dead now. He had an accident at work. Uh, Daff and Sweat. The youngsters down here were considered to be quite uh, beyond control. But in, in the main, it's been my belief that um, Bourneville's not as bad as it's painted. Certainly, from a youth club point of view, um, it wasn't as bad as some people thought. The club was just locked up on by the youngsters as a refuge, but unfortunately by the people who lived in the locality, 
is a place where all the troublemakers gathered. We all lived on the bundle together. We had generations of different gangs. It was me and brother was a skinhead. He was a few years older than me. We had his gangs and we used to just mix in together. And the squad used to knock around with my lot. Okay, that was not the biker okay, gang I used to knock around with, but I used to always knock around with the skinheads as well, funny enough. The frightening thing I can always remember was my mum shouting across the shops and telling me to get home. Because my mum was terrible. <laughs> Stop hanging around them shops. Get home. Shortly before I got uh, sort of integrated with the squad, the states used to fight at states. The Bourneville used to fight the Mixon and the Bourneville used to come down to World and fight the World lads and vice versa. And then all of a sudden it, it changed and the Bourneville lads uh, started recruiting people from other parts of, of Western. I got into the, the skinhead uh, thing, I got my head shaved and uh, basically I got recruited in and uh, I was a full-time member then. I moved from Claverham down here, it's a totally different way of life. I either got learned to go with it and I'd be hardened or you just get pushed on all the time. So in the end I just come, come you know, where I was. And where I was at there, I had guns and bikes and everything else. And when I come here, it just totally ruined my life because my father took everything away from me. You're not allowed to have it because it's a tank. So in the end, I just rebelled against everything. The squad started off. We had, I don't know, all the schools, like Whirl, Wyvern, Broad Oak. I think it happens everywhere in the country. We always have a little rumble with different schools and whatever. And as that happens, we all sort of left the school at the same time. And we all ended up in town. So, come the end of it all, we just all joined together. And uh, basically, then the music started. And that's really where we all turned skinhead. I always used to carry a camera with me. I used to have a special pocket in my jean jacket. And I slid it in. A 110 camera, because you could carry it everywhere. No one could see it, and you could just pull it out on certain moments, and no one would know nothing about it. And uh, I took some good shots with it. A typical bank holiday Monday would be like go to the shops, meet up there about nine, half nine, maybe have a kick about with a football or whatever for a half hour or so till everyone's ready, like get about eight, ten, maybe twelve of you over the shops, like over the social club for a few cheap ciders because that was dynamite fuel. No matter, I don't care what anyone says, that social club cider was the strongest in town. And we get over there and, and like we meet up with another six to a dozen or whatever. And then it'd be stroll into town, maybe via the Ancaster, depends which way we went. But we used to go into Ancaster quite regularly after a while because the police banned us from the social club. They, they told the social club to stop serving us cider. So we all had to go to the Anc and had to pay an extra 10p a pint, which was murder. <laughs> When we actually got to town, we'd, we'd all sort of like go in the Globe or the Cavi, which was the Cavendish Inn, or the Anchor, meet up with the Anchor animals. They were a berserk bunch of animals as well. <laughs> they were a bit more mental than us. I didn't want as many of them. <laughs> and then, like two o'clock, pubs are shut. Some people would have shot off during the afternoon and got a few gallons of screeching for the beach. They would head down the lawns. Unless there was a drinking competition in Max's, and we'd go and steam into that. Drink all the beer, fill in a few bikers. <laughs> and then head to the lawns then, and that was... Just wait and see what, what was going on, like, you know?
after the pub shut, we'd go out and to the side of farm, get some cider and turn out on the seafront. You'd have coach loads of Brummies and Bristol kids or whatever, like, you know, they'd all come down, having a, having, having a drink themselves and we'd be shouting things across, they'd be doing the same and then we'd just go for it in the middle. the law come along or whatever and we usually be the ones that get arrested because the police knew us like so we'd be the ones that arrested and they'd usually get away with everything like, you know? <laughs> 16 news appeared before western super mayor magistrates this morning and fines of up to 300 pounds have been imposed getting fined that much is just going to make them go out and nick stuff and sell it to pay off their fines a lot of the lads did uh, time they did got borstal Etc. Etc. Me, me. I was lucky. I had a good. I had a full-time job at the time, and I just pay, ended up paying up thousands of pounds in fines. To know over years, I'd love to know where it went. I think the best one was um, there must have been 50, 60 of us over on the bingo steps opposite the amusements. We all decided that we're going to go down to the um, Smiths Hotel where all the Brummy skinheads were. There's about 100 of them down there, and uh, we met in, met up with these. 10 or 15 Bristol blokes, 20 Bristol blokes, whatever, and uh, decided that we we're going to do the Brummies together. So we all steamed into Smith's Hotel, kicked the crap out of the Brummies, and on the way back along the beach, we kicked the shit out of the Bristol blokes. And that's when the police were chasing us along the beach on horses. The police started quite a fair bit of the trouble, I'd say. Going into heavy. Even on days when nothing happened, the old bill would be there pushing, and I'm not talking about just us, I'm talking about ordinary pedestrians on the street, like, you know, pushing them all along the seafront to try and get them over onto the beach. Everyone was piling over the wall because the police was trying to push everyone away like from the sea, from the seafront to get them on here out of the way. So uh, that's when we all jumped over the walls and whatever. They had not like, all the Bristol lot was behind the police and they segregated both lots. So uh, that's how come we ended up on here, that fateful day. It was really terrifying for everybody, for them, for the donkeys, the horses and all the public with their little kiddies. They come on the beaches, they come about 400 at a time and they would just make one run all the way and scream and shout. I put it down the police, they used to send them down on the beach to take the trouble off the streets, that, you know, where all the posers were and that. The bank holidays used to spoil it. I mean, obviously the fighting used to spoil it for a lot of people. There was victimisation from the police. I mean, in them days, we were basically sheep ready to be herded up by them. We was out of order sometimes with them, and we did have the occasional scuffle with them, but uh, most, most of the time they just, they just, just loved picking on us. Because they basically had nothing else to do. Then there was a lot of a lot of bad feeling between us and the police. It, it didn't just happen in the summer. I mean, we got victimised in the winter uh, when there weren't any holiday makers around. They did enjoy picking on us, and they knew that we never used to get that much of a fight in court, and they, we were just processed basically. Keep looking you for the same old thing. In the end, those just come out of office licences, walk up the road, a gal on the side of them, yeah, and next thing you know, right van pull up, you and your neck for the day under suspicion. Though. It's a suspicion of what? A suspicion of causing a fray. And if you get in the van, you'll be locked up all day. Then they'll let you go out late at night. I got nicked one bank holiday, the Friday before bank holiday, actually. And because it was a bank holiday Monday on, on the following Monday, the, the courts decided to put me in prison for three weeks so that I wouldn't be out for that bank holiday Monday. There were lots of occasions when youngsters were picked up by the police who weren't really responsible. They were pulled in just because the police knew them and they happened to be in the locality when something went wrong. Bank holidays were the days when the pub shut at three, you know, everyone used to come out on here because you never had nothing else to do, you didn't have nowhere else to go. So you'd be out here wandering around and that's when all the gangs and that would meet up. All your bikers, your mods, or whatever, whatever, whoever come to Western, they'd always end up here. Yeah, this was the prime spot, and it always went off. It's just inevitable, really, till the pubs opened, and it went dead, and finished. Some boys would come around the corner, we had a little ding dong with a few weeks before. Something to do with John, actually, and uh, he just let a fire on him straight away. 
a couple of weeks uh, before the fight, I'd insulted the, the, the bloke's girlfriend, and uh, he threatened me on the spot there and then. He said he'd get me. And, uh, well, I'd forgotten all about it. And then, uh, come a bank holiday, we were all there on the steps, uh, looking at the people going by and the trouble and stuff, and, uh, he suddenly appeared from around the corner <laughs> uh, with all his Western biker friends, because there was a bit of tension in them days with the Western bikers. And he came straight up to me, because I was sat at the bottom of the steps, and offered me out for a fight there and then. And uh, I said, well, no, no, because it was a bank holiday, and uh, yeah, there was police everywhere and hundreds of people. I offered to see him at the park later on that day. But uh, he wouldn't have it, and... Uh, he just suddenly swung a punch at me there and then, and uh, I got up and, lucky enough, Basil was there with the, with the camera and took those famous photographs. It happened so quick, I just got my camera out and clipped off free. I mean, a fight I mean, only lasts a minute if it's a long one, and it's all over, and that was that. I don't even know where the bloke went, actually. Um, the poor lad, uh, basically, I beat seven tons of shit out of him, basically, <laughs> like, you know. <laughs> We ended up shaking hands down the alleyway, and he walked off very embarrassed. <laughs> I think we all scarpered before we got arrested for it. <laughs> I got a brownie point <laughs> on my street cred. <laughs> my favourite memories of the bank holidays was the well, it happened quite a few times. Is when someone would spot there would be a crew of mods arrived in town. They all should come in some numbers as well. I mean, some of them, like, there was the 40 or 50 scooters all come in, and the word would go round, mods are here. And, like, you know, no matter how far away the lads were in town at the time, we'd all converge in Regent Street by the bingo steps. And my favourite moment was just, uh, like, between 50 and 60 of us just screaming down Regent Street, like, because all these mods were coming at one, so, like, one far end, and we were right at the other, and we just took over the whole road and just 50 or 60 screaming skinheads and punks like just heading towards these mods and they all slammed their brakes on and just did a big U-turn and off they went like you know absolutely wet in their pants that's one of my favourites years ago when we were down when we were all skinheads they had 2,000 mods turned on and took on 200 skinheads but the skinheads won so that was all over within minutes because the police the riot police and all the horsebacks and all that broke it all up but it was all good fun. It was all good day out, so I was happy with it. <laughs> and then there's these good old fashioned punch it ups and somebody might get a kick on the floor, some somebody might get a boot in the head. But there was no we had we never carried weapons or tools or anything like that. It was fists uh, fists and boots. Strictly that. The Western turf was sacred ground for us. And I can honestly say that I can't remember anyone coming down from outside town and taking us on and winning, I can honestly say. I never got any severe beatings, and I didn't know any of the lads who got any severe beatings. We was always outnumbered. I mean, like, you know, probably we had about 50 skinheads. And uh, you get, like, three or 400 come down from Bristol. You know, and uh, that's quite funny looking back on it, to be honest. Like, you know, we used to get chased everywhere. <laughs> you know, have a little, a little dig on the beach here and there. You know, but you was vastly outnumbered. It was a good day, eight. It's a bit of fun. Yeah, and that was it. As I said, you went home to tea, and that was the day over. Yeah, well, the thing that comes springs to mind, it was a good pose. <laughs> and it was very fashionable, and uh, the music enhanced it all. You see uh, if, like, the guys in the specials with their rude boy haircuts and uh, the kilt on, and you want to be like them. And... Uh, and it all seemed to fit into the skinhead revival at the time from the late 60s. Uh, and I think, yeah, and it was, it, we definitely wanted to be someone as well. It was all part of being someone, which we, uh, which we wanted to be, because most, I mean, a lot of the lads were unemployed and they didn't have nothing to do with all their time, and they just wanted to be someone, and uh, the squad uh, enhanced that. It was a golden age, actually, it was to do with the music. And, uh... Well, not just the scene at the time, really. I mean, I well, had some good times, I had some good mates. Thoroughly enjoyed every moment of it, actually, where well, they were the days of my youth. But the best thing about it was there wasn't, there wasn't nobody was in charge of the squad, like, you know? There wasn't no leader or nothing like that. 
everyone sort of like had the same respect for each other. You know, and if, obviously if one person got into trouble, then it was one and all, like, you know? There wasn't ever a time when no one ducked a, ducked a fight or whatever, or, or a shindig, or a scuffle with the bill. But there's no gangs like the squad anymore. I don't think there ever will be. That was it. I'm glad, actually, because I, like I like to think of us as a one-off elite. Unless there is a major uh, skinhead revival, skinhead punk revival in the future, I don't think there ever will be another squad or anything to match them. I think where the squad has stuck out on the, in the story is because they was really the last gang that used to hang around because things sort of changed then. It seems now you don't get so many gangs around, but it's funny how the, the girls seem to be picking up on it now and you're getting girl gangs hanging around and, and doing the sort of things that boys used to do. And uh, walking like blokes and all. <laughs> Obviously times have changed now. You go down on a bank holiday Monday now, you can take your kids, I, I go there with my missus, I take my dog, I feel comfortable. Uh, there's no trouble. It was just one of those, it was one of those eras. Um, which people have basically grown out of now, and it's, it's passed. I've always worked, so uh, it's, it's just that uh, I've got to channel my money now into the family rather than out having a piss up all the time. I mean, I, I still go out weekends, still see all my mates, still see all the old squad boys and that, but it's uh, a little bit toned down now. These days I do regard myself as a respectable citizen, even though I might not look it. You know, I've got two children to bring oh, up. Look at the hole. Very nice as well they are. The ball. And they've done right. me pride. Yeah. Both Take of them. Straight shot. Really have done me justice. Good girl. Right, Dean, take your time. Look at the hole. Do your stuff. Good shot. The most important thing in my life is to... Uh, Keep hold of most of the things I got, like my boats and that, my cars yeah. and my rods and my dog. I like them, and I think they're the greatest thing you've ever seen is them staff or terrorists. Like, you know, what you got, one and never want another one. The same, just have a good time. <laughs> Rock and roll. Put your braces together and your boots on your feet, and give me some of that old moon stamping. Get ready. couldn't see us. We waited for them just to line up and hit them with the milk bottles. What's that? No, we're all scored. Yeah, fucking right. And like we went back, we went back to the, we went back all the way back to West and we got two traffic lights and a couple went. Have you just come from Rome? Yeah, he was just said, what are you, some kind of suicide squad? And we went there, we're just a squad. We went there, and there was me, Peyton, Chris Bowles, Ian Page, Dyes, the Bennett Brothers, Fudgy Wicks, and Chris Bowles, that was it. That was the block. Oh, and Tone. And Tone. Very enjoyable misspent youth. <laughs>
<laughs> I don't regret a thing. In fact, if I could, could I'd go back and do it all again. It was gr- it was great fun. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 yeah.